I'm a bit obsessed with symmetry and patterns. For me, it was always really satisfying seeing the Pokemon games release in duos and then with the third version a year or so later. There's also a certain symmetry between the games and the Pokemon that were introduced. For example, the Pokemon from Generation 1 are then mirrored in the new Pokemon introduced in Generation 5. For example, Sock and Throw are kind of like Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee, Clink Clang is sort of like Magneton, Gigalith is like Golem, and Conkledur is like Machamp. And Anyway, this list just keeps going on, and I could go through all of them, but we don't have time. We have to get to Generation 3, where it seems like the Pokemon company tried to design most Pokemon with counterparts in mind. So in the early game, instead of having one two-stage rodent, we have a pair of them instead. Puchiana and Zigzagoon, a dark type and a normal type. Instead of just having one regional bird, we have Swellow as well as Pelipper. When I was initially planning my Emerald series in these games, I looked through the list of Pokemon and realized that I could almost exclusively go through Emerald version doing Versus videos. There are so many interesting Pokemon pairings that Game Freak just baked into the game. And in some situations, they used game mechanics to emphasize these pairings. And that brings us to the ghostly subjects of this video. Shuffet and Duskull are not version exclusives, but one is more common in each version of the game. So if you're playing Pokemon Ruby, you're going to see a lot more Duskull because they're present on more roots, but if you're playing Pokemon Sapphire, you're going to see a lot more Shuppet. I grew up playing Ruby, and I always thought that Shuppet was the superior ghost because it was way cuter, whereas my friend grew up playing Sapphire, and he always felt like Duskull was the better one. Unfortunately, we were never able to trade with each other, so we just had to look and admire the other ghosts from afar. I actually didn't know that these Pokemon weren't version exclusives until I started making this video. Pairing Pokemon together like this can seem unfair from a race perspective because I think that Bayonet is going to perform significantly better, and we're going to get into why in just a second. But I never try to pair Pokemon together on my initial playthroughs based on how they're going to perform. I instead pair them together in the way that Game Freak did in the game design. After all, playing Pokemon Ruby, I probably would have used Duskull if I made a ghost a part of my team, although I never did. And the reason is because Duskull and Dusclops are pretty defensive, and that was not how I like to play as a kid. Did. Just before we get into this, these are the rules, you can find them in the description. I'm going to play one first playthrough just to scout out how these Pokemon play in Pokemon Emerald, then I'm going to come back and do follow-up attempts to try and get better times with each of them before ranking them in my final tier list. Okay, with those logistics out of the way, now we're ready to go. For base stats, Dusclops has 40 HP, 70 attack, 130 defense and special defense, but only 25 speed and 60 special attack. Because its speed is so irredeemable, I'm going to be using a brave nature today to increase my physical attack and lower my speed. I also should draw your attention to the fact that both of these ghosts are the fast level up group. What? That seems so strange. Again, like Lunatone and Solrock, it is something I did not expect. Going into this, I was pretty sure they were going to be medium fast, but no, apparently they're the fast growth rate, so are they like ghosts of fairies or something? I don't know. Dusclops' move pool starts with Bind, Leer, Nightshade, and Disable. Honestly, not a good starting set. Nightshade can't hit normal Pokemon, so I'm going to have to rely on a lot of bind in those cases. Beyond this, it doesn't get very many good offensive moves. Foresight, Astonish, Confuse Ray, Pursuit, Curse, Shadow Punch, Will-O-Wisp, Mean Look, and Future Sight. You can really see that they wanted this thing to play defensively, especially because it has the ability Pressure, which, as you would expect, lowers PP twice as fast. Some move pool relief does come in the form of TMs and HMs. It gets Calm Mind later in the game, which will be very useful to boost the power of moves like Ice Beam and Psychic. Beyond that, it gets Rock Tomb and Earthquake, which are great physical moves, but most of these are available quite late into the game, so I'm expecting the early portions of this run to be a little bit painful. I don't think I stack up particularly well against Roxanne, so I'm going to battle some optional trainers on the early roots of the game. Then I run into youngster Alan, he's this guy, who has a Zigzagoon and a Talo. I have to use Bind to knock his Pokemon out, and while this does work for the Zigzagoon because it only has normal moves, the Talo knows Peck, which can damage Ghost-type Pokemon, and it does way more damage than I was expecting against my Dusclops. As a result of this, I actually take an early blackout in this playthrough. Can't believe it, youngster Alan has never defeated me before. I come back face him again, this time I realized that I can use Disable on Peck so that it can only use Growl, then while I do knock it out slower, I am able to take the victory. At level 12 I learned Foresight, now I had a misunderstanding of how this move works. It does not allow ghost type moves to hit normal type Pokemon. Foresight only allows normal and fighting type moves to hit ghosts. So 
that's a little bit strange with how Dusclops learns it. Do they want you to attack ghosts with bind? Maybe. So unfortunately for me, this move does not solve the normal type problem like I was expecting it to. Before the gym, I stopped by the trainer school to pick up the quick claw from the teacher because this move is going to allow Dusclops to move first, which will be relevant in a little bit. Inside the gym, there's a bunch of rock ground types. Luckily, no normal types, so I can use Nightshade here. I level up quite quickly and get to level 14 before Roxanne. Okay, let's talk about speed interactions and how her AI works. She's going to prioritize Rock Tomb as a speed control move until my Pokemon is at a lower speed than her Pokemon. I was expecting the first Geodude to go for it right away, but instead it sets up Defense Curl. It actually does this twice, then she uses a Potion, and I'm able to knock it out with Nightshade, taking no damage. Alright, not exactly what I was expecting. The next Geodude is slower. It's also going for Defense Curl. I'm not sure why. Eventually though it does hit with Rock Tomb, this brings my speed down to 9. Now, the speed interaction is less important against the Geodudes, it's more important against the Nose Pass, because the Geodude have Rock Throw which they can default to using after they've used Rock Tomb to lower your speed, but once you're slower than the Nose Pass, it's only going to use Rock Tomb if it sees a KO with it. And that's not going to happen because Dusclops has a lot of defense and a ton of health. The cruel irony of this for Roxanne is that Nose Pass, as a trash Pokemon, gets caught using trash moves like Harden and Block. I don't actually think it's ever going to do damage to Dusclops if I have decent health once I arrive here. So this fight is essentially free once the two Geodudes are knocked out. Okay, so the first badge in this run gives me a 10% boost to my attack stat, which is great because ghost moves in Generation 3 are physical. Just around the corner, I learn Astonish, which is a direct damage dealing ghost move with a 30% chance to flinch the opponent. In order to do that, I need to move first though, and Dusclops has low speed. This is where the Quick Claw comes in. It gives the holder a 20% chance of moving first within its priority bracket. So on one fifth of the turns that I use Astonish, I'll have a chance of flinching the opponent. It's not great, but every little thing that you can do really does count. South of Rustboro City, I fight the rival again. This is just for experience. Really, I'm training for Watson, because Brawly, who's next, is going to be completely impotent. As you might expect, he's a fighting type specialist. On Duford Island, I pick up the Silk Scarf. Not really useful right now. The Quick Claw is definitely the better held item. Inside the gym, I fight a bunch of optional trainers to gain as many levels as possible. This allows Duskops to almost reach level 20. And now, let's take on Brawly. This fight is going to be a joke, by the way, for both of these Pokemon. His team consists of three fighting types, all of them have exclusively fighting type moves, with the exception of Light Screen and Reflect, which are psychic type moves. That means that Brawly cannot damage either Dusclops or Bayonet, and this is going to be the last time that I mention him during this video. Bye bye Brawly, it was great seeing you. Send my regards to Bruno. On Slateport Beach, I collect the Soft Sand, this will be useful later on for Earthquake. Inside the museum, I pick up the TM for Thief, which by the way you can get before you fight the trainers on the top floor. For the longest time, I thought this was only receivable after you defeated the two trainers up there, but it's not. I'm going to teach it in the place of Foresight, but do remember that Thief and all Dark type moves in Generation 3 deal special damage, so they're leveraging Dusclops' lower attacking stat. Also just before going upstairs, I teach one more move, which is Rock Tomb in the place of Bind. I think I should have added this to my set a little bit earlier earlier for normal types, and overall it is the most powerful move that I have access to right now. Although the 80% accuracy is something that just frustrates me endlessly, watch it miss here against the Team Aquagrunt. Ugh, I hate this move. Anyways, let's move on, head north towards the rival, and eventually Watson, who is usually the most difficult gym leader in Pokemon Emerald. On my way I stop by the Trick House, this is to get one extra rare candy. It's not super helpful with fast growth rate Pokemon, but I want to be as safe as possible in these initial playthroughs. I also head a little bit west, grabbing this PP up. You have to fight two optional trainers to get it, but it can be worth it for two different reasons. Number one, for its intended purpose, increasing your PP, which is always good. And number two, to be sold for money in case you want to buy Psychic really early into a run. The rival's next, and his Lombre has a move that's super effective against Dusclops. It's Astonish. Do you know how much damage it does? It does five damage. What a trash Pokemon, and what a trash move. I knock the Lombre out and move on to the Marsh Tomp. I wasn't sure which team would be strongest against Go, Ghosts, but I figured since Rock Tomb my best move is not very effective against Marsh Tomp, this would probably be the hardest pairing. I use Rock Tomb to lower its speed, and then I use Nightshade for more consistent damage. Doing this, I actually get brought to decently low health, making this one of the closest fights so far since Youngster Allen. 
After defeating the rival, fighting other trainers, I have a chance to learn Pursuit. It has the same base power when compared with Thief, but stealing the opponent's hell item is far more useful because the AI very rarely switches. Inside Watson's gym, I fight three trainers, leveling up to 29, and then in the surrounding region, I fight some additional trainers that have decent experience yields like this bug catcher who has two fully evolved Pokemon. This is so I can get Dusclops to level 30 over the next damage rounding threshold. Okay, now it's time for the man, the myth, the legend, Watson. Okay, speed is a big problem for Dusclops here because I am slower than every single one of his Pokemon, as you would expect. I'm also going to be two-hitting most of them because I just don't have the damage I need to one-shot. The Voltorb could paralyze me with Spark, the Electrike can paralyze me, but only with Static. And I play right into it because I should have used Rock Tomb to knock it out, which doesn't make contact, but Astonish does. As a result, I get paralyzed before the Magneton comes in. And I'm not holding a Cherry Berry because I prioritized the Quick Claw. I figured that Dusclops was going to get paralyzed by some point in this fight, and having the chance to move first despite the status condition would overall be better on multiple turns. Now what I'm really hoping for here to take the win is that Nightshade is going to do enough damage to the Magneton, and if you look at its health it has exactly 59. I'm level 30, so I know that I'm guaranteed a 2 hit, that is if I don't get messed up by paralysis and confusion. Luckily I don't, I knock out the Magneton and I still have green health left over for the Manectric. This is where things fall apart. I hit myself in confusion, tank damage from Shockwave, then hit myself in confusion again, Nightshade Nightshade does not have enough damage to 2 hit, it's going to 3 hit, and as a result the Manectric gets the win. Okay, so this is annoying, but it's definitely possible with Dusclops at this level. There's no need to waste time leveling up, I can just continue trying this fight and eventually I'll defeat Watson. I take a very fast loss because the Voltorb paralyzes me. <laughs> this did not go well. Anyways, resetting on the Voltorb's pretty embarrassing. In the next fight, I make it past the Electric back to the Magneton, I knock it out, but I only have 19 hit points remaining. And that is not enough to finish off the Manectric. I tried again, and this fight seemed like it was going better. I'm not paralyzed by his final Pokemon, but still he's able to defeat me because the Manectric has a Citrus Berry, plus he has Super Potions. Maybe I do need to level up. I fight trainers until level 32, and then I come back to try the fight again. I have one more loss using the Quick Claw, and then I realize that the Cherry Berry is actually the superior play. Here's why. If I'm using it, then once I get paralyzed, I'll heal that status condition. Then his AI is probably going to prioritize something like Thunder Wave to paralyze me again. And an additional benefit of having no held item is that I can use Thief on the Manectric to steal its Citrus Berry. This doesn't work out twice in a row, but on the third attempt, finally, I'm able to steal the Citrus Berry. Very satisfying. Beyond that, I wasn't paralyzed early into the fight and I had decent health, and then with Nightshade, I slowly knock out his ace. Even in this situation, things are pretty close, and I only make it through the battle with 25 hit points remaining. The third badge gives a 10% boost to my speed stat, but even then, I only have 33. Yeah, Dusclops if it has any hope of moving first, needs to be holding the Quick Claw. I'm going to re-equip that item and then head north. Next I can get the TM for Secret Power, a decent normal type move with 70 base power. I'm going to replace Nightshade. After passing all the way through Fall Arbor Town and Meteor Falls, I fight this trainer who has good experience yields. He's got Zangoose and Surviper, another interesting pairing of Pokemon which are in fact version exclusives. Defeating them levels me up to 34, where Dusclops can learn Curse. Now this move can be really good, and it can also be quite bad. In this case I'm going to teach it in the place of Astonish because that move has really fallen off at this point. Maybe Curse is going to have a niche, we'll have to see what comes. One of the reasons to come over here and fight this guy is so that I can jump over this ledge and pick up one additional PP up. I'm also able to loop through the middle of the map and collect the Strength HM right now. For some Pokemon I could buy Psychic right now, but for Dusclops I haven't collected quite enough items, I've not been focused on this as the goal. I don't think Psychic would be a big game changing move at this point in the run. With my physical attack I want to be using Secret Power. So to progress with the run, I've got to face Maxi next. Okay, this is the first really surprising battle in the run. Mighty Anna is an awful lead to go up against when you're a Dusclops. It lowers my attack with Intimidate, and I have no way of getting that stat back. Even if I had Psychic, I couldn't use it on his lead Pokemon, plus Bite is super effective against me. Luckily my defenses basically say, no, it's not, it's only doing a tiny amount of damage. Although Maxi does have a super potion, so he heals his Mighty Anna, delaying the time that I take to knock it out. And I thought I was going to knock it out, but it flinches me with bite because again, Dusclops is not very fast. So yeah, the first Pokemon on his team defeats Dusclops. Okay, like Mighty Anna is annoying in these playthroughs, but it's rarely this good. And I, I don't know, it doesn't even feel like it's that good. It chipped away at me and just slowly knocked Dusclops out, winning because of flinches. Well, at least that's what I thought. I tried the battle again and once again lost to the Mighty Anna. You know what it took to defeat this thing? I had to have
have Secret Power's secondary effect activate, which on this train inflicts confusion. Then, after a super potion, the Mighty Anna just hits itself enough number of times and I knock it out. That is not the way I like to win these battles. Now, Hidden Power might be a good solution in my follow-up playthrough for the Mighty Anna, but we'll discuss that a little bit later. For now, we need to focus on Maxi's final Pokémon, the Camerupt. I inflict confusion right away with Secret Power, which is lucky, and then I get unlucky because Camerupt does not hit itself, uses Ember, and burns Dusclops. I take damage from the status condition, going down to 10 hit points, then because of Sand Attack from the Mighty Anna, I miss my next Secret Power, and Camerupt styles all over me using Focus Energy, and I lose to burn damage. Okay, now we're going to talk about Hidden Power. I'm going to go back down the gondola and backtrack all the way to Slateport City in order to pick up this move. For this playthrough, I have set my IVs to assign Dusclops Hidden Power Fighting. This is so I have a move that's physical that I can use against Steven Stone. I wanted to leverage my higher attacking stat, plus Ghost and Fighting type moves together give neutral coverage against all Pokemon in the game. So it's just a really good type pairing. I had to figure out which move to let go of. I kind of want to keep Thief around. It can be really useful against Flannery in some niche instances. So without using Curse, I'm going to give that move up in favor of having the fighting type move. I was hoping the battle against Maxi would go better, but this fight does not start well. Intimidate, then bite into a flinch. After that, sand attack, hidden power misses into another bite, and then finally hidden power hits, but it does not do enough to knock out. So I get taken down to orange health before moving on with the rest of the battle. Rock Tomb one-shots the Zubat, then I use Secret Power against the Camerupt, it sets up with Focus Energy, doesn't burn me this time, and after a Super Potion I take a few more turns and finally knock it out. Okay, let's spring forward into the battle against Flannery. Okay, we have Nummel and Slugma, her first two Pokemon, which are just terrible. But I'm also really bad. I choose Hidden Power, which has lower effective power when compared with Secret Power. If I had gone for the normal type move, I would have knocked the Nummel out. Since it survived, it gets to go for Magnitude, rolling Magnitude 9, doing decent damage. I guess this is decent damage to a Dusclops. Then I miss my Rock Tomb on the Slugma. It goes for Smog and poisons me. This never makes sense. Let's be real. Dusclops is a ghost. Why would you be able to poison a ghost? It's already dead. Anyways, minor mechanical gripes aside, this status condition does cause serious problems during this battle, because the Camerupt is able to hit with a massive overheat, and then the chip damage from Poison, alongside the fact that I'm never going to one-hit the Torkoal, spells defeat for Dusclops. Okay, the next battle is quite painful. Notice I have equipped an Orinberry, because I want a little bit of healing during this fight, as well as the ability to thief the White Herb from the Torkoal later into the battle, so that it lowers its special attack when choosing overheat. But this has a problem. Now I don't one-shot the Nummel, even with secret power. Luckily for me, I don't take damage. Rock Tomb does hit the Slugma, so I'm in better condition by the time I make it to the Camerupt. Then, uh, pay attention to how much damage it deals to me. It misses an Overheat, sets up Sunny Day, she uses a potion on it, and then it hits with Overheat, which deals almost half, like almost half. I survive with 45 hit points. That is one hit point away from being at half health, so I don't consume my Orenberry. As a result, I can't thieve the Torkoal's item, but this is just an annoyance for me because Overheat has more than enough damage, since the sun's out. I lost one more time, and that convinced me to reevaluate my strategy here. Going to Fall Arbor Town, I can grab the TM for Return, which is a damage improvement over Secret Power. It takes my effective power up from 77 with the Silk Scarf up to 86 with the Silk Scarf. I fight one trainer as well to bring my level up to 36 before trying Flannery again. One hitting the Nummel and the Slugma consistently is nice, but then the camera still has time to set up Sunny Day for the Torkoal. I make a mistake here, trying for the old strategy. Of course, I can't thief anything when I'm holding the Silk Scarf, so whoops. Also, the Return is just not doing enough damage. The more I kept trying, I started to realize that this is just not going to happen unless Overheat misses or I get a critical hit with Return. Even when that happens, if it's not on the right Pokémon, for instance against the Camerupt, not the Torkoal, then I still lose. After what is my 16th total reset, I decided to do something I have never done before. Deposit all of my HM users and come back and face Flannery with only Dusclops. The reason for this is that I can black out every time and keep the experience from Nummel, Slugma, and Camerupt. Normally I don't like to play things this way, it's part habit, but also I don't like to navigate the entire gym multiple times. Also doing things this way inflates my game time, but right now I think it is the best strategy with Dusclops. Each time I go into the fight, I have the chance to crit the Torkoal or for it to miss with Overheat. 
While doing this, I level up to 37 and have the chance to learn Shadow Punch. Despite it having the word punch in its name, it is not similar to moves like Thunder Punch, Ice Punch, or Fire Punch, inflicting a status condition. Instead, it's Ghost Type Swift. Or maybe Faint Attack. It would be nice if they had named this Shadow Attack, so we would have the parallelism between Faint Attack and Shadow Attack. Then my brain would be able to more easily memorize all the secondary effects and not make as many mistakes in these videos. Does this bother anyone else? I really wish they assigned words to certain effects so that we would know what the move did intuitively. This is a big gripe of mine. Anyways, in this case, Shadow Punch is actually quite helpful. You'll notice that it and Return have a similar base power when I'm holding the Silk Scarf, but I can actually get rid of the Silk Scarf and then use Shadow Punch and also be able to thieve the Torkoal's White Herb, reducing damage from its second overheat. This improves my odds of winning if I get through the camera up with decent health. By the way, I actually want to mention something that I didn't realize at first, but blacking out here has a secondary advantage. If I'm using the thief strategy and I black out after stealing the white herb, I will just have this item after the battle. And that means I can infinitely farm these from Flannery, an item that normally I only have one copy of in these runs. I could essentially have as many as I want to counter all the future Mighty Enna's Intimidates. I don't want to hang around here though just to farm these items, instead I'll defeat Flannery if I'm able to. And in the very next battle after stealing the white herb, Overheat starts doing very little damage. As a result, I thought I was going to win, and then Flannery uses a Hyper Potion, crushing my hopes. However, the sun has faded, so Torkoal sets it up again, giving me one more turn to attack. But Shadow Punch isn't doing enough damage. Unless it gets a critical hit. Okay, so with luck, we defeat Flannery and move on with the playthrough. This was a really rough early game. 16 resets, 5 blackouts, and over an hour on the clock. I want a break from Dusclops, I really do. So I'm going to play some Bayonet now, and believe me, this thing is much better. Its base stats are not what you would expect. 64 HP, 65 speed and defense, 63 special defense, and then 83 special attack and 115 attack. It feels a little bit thematically weird to me to have a ghost that's a physical attacker, but in Generation 3, this synergizes perfectly. Shadow Ball, which is physical, is going to hit so hard when I eventually get it. But that's a ways away. For now, we have to use our early game moveset. Knock Off, Screech, Nightshade, and Curse. Honestly, I think this one is better than Dusclops. Bind is trash. Access to Knock Off to deal with normal types, or in some cases, Curse to speed them up, is really helpful. Through level up, Bayonet's moves are not great. Spite, Will-O-Wisp, Faint Attack, Shadow Ball, Snatch, and Grudge. But through TM and HM, it gets access to some decent moves. Like Dusclops, it gets Calm Mind, but then it doesn't get the same elemental moves. Instead of Ice moves, it gets Electric moves. Thunderbolt, Thunder, and Shockwave. The thing is, all the normal moves are just going to hit way harder. And for Bayonet, I'm using a Naughty Nature, which increases my attack stat and decreases my special defense. If you're wondering why special defense specifically, it's because Steven Stone is the final trainer in the game. He is really good, and decreasing your defense stat never feels good against him. While Wallace is a water type specialist and he's second last, decreasing my special defense feels fine, especially because I have Calm Mind to make up for that deficit. Okay, let's move on to Roxanne. Here, I'm going to be using Nightshade, once again at level 13. This is one level too low to two-shot the Geodude with Nightshade. Maybe I should level up to get that, probably not. Honestly, Roxanne is very simple. After my speed gets lowered, again, the Nose Pass is just going to stop doing anything unless it sees it can get a KO. And if you watched my Nose Pass video a month or two ago, you will know that this thing is unlikely to see knockouts, because its attack stat is really trash. Turn 1, I can use Knock Off to remove its Orenberry. That's actually useful. After that, then I can use Nightshade to knock it out. Small downside for Bayonet when compared with Dusclops, it does not learn Rock Tomb, so I don't get a physical move that's useful right away. This leads us to Bayonet's biggest downside. The fact that its attack stat is so high. I know I've really emphasized that, and it doesn't get a physical move until it beats Watson and obtains the Secret Power TM. So in the early game, this thing is just fumbling around with Knock Off and Nightshade. I can upgrade Knock Off to Thief in Slateport City, and then mirroring perfectly how I feel towards Game Freak. I learn Spite in the place of Screech. Alright, Rival 2 time. As I said, we're not talking about Brawly. This fight's pretty straightforward. I can just spam Nightshade and essentially beat all of his Pokemon. While I do get taken down to low-ish hit points, the Slugma that comes out last is just not a threat. Alright, time for Watson. I leveled up on trainers in the surrounding regions to get to level 
dirty. This is not enough to two-shot the Voltorb with Thief. That's really annoying. At level 30, I would do 60 damage, so Nightshade would be the better choice here, but I just refuse to use it. While Thief is able to two-shot the Electrike, by the time I make it to the Magneton, I'm on red health, so this fight felt hopeless, and that encouraged me to train with Bayonet. Note that I did play this playthrough first, because I thought the Dusclops was the underdog of these two. After all, Bayonet is a physical attacker, whereas Dusclops is a defensive Pokemon. It tends to be the case in solo challenges that defensive Pokemon are always at a disadvantage. At least if you're like me and evaluating Pokemon based on the time it takes them to beat the game. In the surrounding region, I do so much training, leveling up over the next damage rounding threshold at level 33 before I return to Watson. During this training, I have a chance to learn the move Will-O-Wisp, which I teach in the place of Spite because I think it will be more useful. Now I know to two-shot the Voltorb using Nightshade, as well as the Electric that follows. Magneton is next, and I can also two-shot it, so holding the Cherry Berry allowed me to move on to the Manectric without a status condition and with green health. Turn 1, Manectric paralyzes me. I'm gonna three-shot with Nightshade. I forgot to use Thief turn 1. I really should have. I attack in twice with Nightshade and then trigger the Citrus Berry. After that, I use Thief, hoping for chip damage so that he doesn't use a Super Potion, but he still does. However, then Watson drops the ball because he uses Howl, and Manectric's only physical move is Quick Attack. Due to this misplay, I'm able to attack the Manectric enough times, and I survive the battle with nine hit points, earning myself the third badge. With this win, I teach Bayonet Shockwave in the place of Nightshade. But this is not the upgrade that I'm most excited for, because finally I can get the Secret Power TM, and Bayonet at long last has access to a physical move. By the way, I looked it up to see if Bayonet could get physical moves by breeding, and yes it can. If you breed with a Mischievous, Duskull, Dusclops, or Chimeco, it can get Astonish. Uh, that is astonishingly bad. It is a physical move, but it's not a very good one. Bayonet is so much better against Maxi. Despite my attack stack getting lowered by Intimidate, it doesn't matter. Secret Power is still able to two-shot and I avoid bite entirely. From there, it's just a matter of time before I clean up the Zubat and the camera. Before Flannery, I make the decision to backtrack to Fallerbird Town to pick up the Return TM. I wanted the increased base power before taking on the Fire-type Specialist. Does Bayonet have what it takes to make it through this battle with less pain? Well, certainly at the beginning it does. It one-shots both the Nummel and the Slugma easily. Then against Camerupt, I am not able to one-hit, so it establishes Sunny Day. Flannery uses a Hyper Potion, healing it, and I'm able to two-shot after that. This heal was actually good for me because it stalled out the Sun counter. But there are still two turns of Sun left over by the time the Torkoal comes in. Return with the Silk Scarf does less than half, and Overheat brings me down to red health. Okay, so without a crit or a miss, it looks like we're in a similar position compared with Dusclops. Things can go worse because the camera, instead of using Sunny Day, can also use Overheat, doing damage to me early into the battle. Then once I make it to the Torkoal, Bayonet can't survive. I did a little bit of training inside the gym to level up. I wanted to get to 38 if possible, but I wasn't able to do it. Still, when I fight Flannery, knocking out the Nummel, the Slugma, and the camera gives me enough experience to be over the damage rounding threshold by the time I'm facing the Torkoal. Will this give Bayonet the two-shot with return? Well, the answer is yes when I get a critical hit. As a result of that luck, I'm able to finish off her ace and earn myself the fourth badge. Bayonet is now in the lead by over 15 minutes, which is pretty ridiculous after the fourth gym leader. I think we all knew this thing was going to perform better, although anything can happen in these runs. I was shocked by the first playthrough results with Lunatone and Solrock, as well as their follow-up attempts, but I do doubt that something like that that's going to happen here today. On my way back to Petalburg City to face Norman, I pick up the White Herb. With Bayonet, I didn't have a chance to thieve it from Torkoal, so at least I have one from this location. Speaking of Thief, I'm going to replace it when inside the normal gym with Faint Attack. It has a higher base power, and I think the secondary effect is more useful now. Okay, so Norman, the normal type specialist. You would think that this would be fairly straightforward as a ghost type, but he actually has decent coverage. Spin does first, it has Psybeam, Vigoroth has Faint Attack, Linoon cannot hit my ghosts, and Slacking can use Faint Attack as well. With Bayonet, I don't have a way to set up. You might think that Will-O-Wisp would be a good idea, but remember Faint Attack is a special move in Generation 3, so just go on the all-out offense. I burn his Hyper Potion on the Vigoroth, which is convenient. Then he sends in Slacking. This one, I tried to go for Will-O-Wisp because I figured I was going to take maybe 3 or 4 hits to knock it out and that the chip damage could be helpful. 
Unfortunately, I miss and tank a faint attack as a result. All right, let's see how much damage return is doing. It looks like about a third, which I was expecting. I go back to using Will-O-Wisp. I'm actually trying to play around counter here. In generation one, it can hit ghost type Pokemon, but in generation three, it can't. So I'm just being silly. In the end, it doesn't matter. Slacking goes down and Linoon is extra free because I one hit with return. I have to turn the generator off in New Mauville to get access to the Thunderbolt TM. I teach this to Bayonet right away in the place of Will-O-Wisp and then head to Fortree City. On my way, I have to face Shelly. She's really simple. Thunderbolt has excellent coverage against water types, and it's also useful when my attack gets lowered with Intimidate. Although, I will mention that Bayonet's special attack is so low that it's still lower than its physical attack in this situation. The rival's next. His team is pretty bad. I can't use Thunderbolt against the Marsh Tomp, another reason why I think it's maybe the most difficult starter for these two ghosts to face. Return just barely doesn't one-shot, but the Marsh Tomp is more an annoyance than anything else. In Fortree City, I pick up the TM for Hidden Power. I haven't focused on it a lot until until this point, but it is a fire type move with Bayonet. I spoke about the amazing synergy between fighting and ghost type moves, but I wanted to have access to a special move that I could pair with Thunderbolt and Calm Mind for the late game. Of course, I played Bayonet first, so make of that what you will. Now, let's face Winona. Swablu is first, I want to avoid Parish Song here, I go for Thunderbolt and one shot. I could have potentially taught Hidden Power Fire to counter the Tropius, but I figured Return would be good enough. It sets up Sunny Day, which would have improved Hidden Power Fire. Oh well, it's fine, I can knock it out with Return over two more turns, and then move on to her next Pokemon. The reason I'm holding onto Shockwave is because I want to have a move that bypasses accuracy checks for the Elite Four. Sometimes things get annoying there with moves like Sand Attack or Double Team. Plus, after the Tropius, I can one-shot both the Pelipper and the Skarmory using Thunderbolt. That leaves only the Altaria, and of course for it, I'm going to use Return. It sets up with Dragon Dance once, then uses Earthquake, not doing very much damage, and Winona is defeated. Okay, let's talk about Mount Pyre. This is the location where I can pick up the Shadow Ball TM. At long last, Bayonet is going to get access to a same type attack bonus ghost type move that has a decent base power, 80. That said, picking this TM up does cost time because I have to go off of the main path, and I would learn this move through level up at only 48, which is just three levels away. Because I'm so close to learning it through level up, I decided not to use the TM for it, which makes no sense. I can use the move reminder to get it back once I reach level 4, so I don't know what I'm doing here, I probably should have just skipped the TM altogether to save the time. I defeat the rival in Lily Cove City, no problems in this battle, and then inside the department store, I pick up Protein to improve my attack stat. And I also grab some Carbos to improve my speed just a little bit. If you look in the bottom left, you can see my current EVs as I use these vitamins. Do note in Generation 3, if you use a vitamin when you're at like 91 attack, it's only going to take you up to 100, it truncates off at the threshold. So using a vitamin on my speed right now at 90 5 doesn't make a lot of sense. This is contrary to how the mechanics work in Generation 1 and 2. If you use a vitamin in those games one point under the threshold, it will still apply the full value to the stat experience. Okay, time for Maxi and the Magma Hideout. This one's straightforward. I get hit by Intimidate, then by Scary Face, and finally Swagger. Luckily, I have a Person Berry, so I snap out of Confusion and knock out his lead. But the Crobat that follows is very fast, and it would have moved first even without the Scary Face. It is able to confuse Bayonet again, and I hit myself, doing a lot of damage and confusion. Then it starts using Bite, taking me down to orange health. Luckily I snap out of confusion, land return, and Crobat faints. This levels me up to 48, where I teach Shadow Ball in the place of faint attack. Okay, let's go. Obviously, Camerupt is easy to dispatch now, with my same type attack bonus move. There's a bunch of stuff I do next, and I'm going to skip through most of it. I grab an additional return TM in Pacific Log Town, and then, inside Tate and Liza's gym, I decide to use a bunch of rare candies. Bayonet's level 53, so I use 5, bringing it up to level 50 before facing the psychic type gym leaders. Now, it's fair to say that I would have been fine at level 53, but I tend to use all my rare candies right before this gym, just because it's a double battle and I have to beat them with only one Pokemon. I tempered my approach not using all the rare candies, instead choosing to only use five. Hopefully if that makes sense to all of you, I'm kind of taking the middle road here. I give Bayonet a person berry, and now I'm ready. For this fight I have to bring an HM user in, but it always gets one shot by the Claydol's Earthquake. In this case it came close to saving the Zigzagoon because I knock out the Claydol with one hit from Shadow Ball, but the Zatu targets Zigzagoon and knocks it out. Okay, from here it's pretty simple. Target the Lunatone because it has Hypnosis. The Zatu has Confuse Rate, but I have a Person Berry to counter it. Next Soul Rock comes in and I target it because I haven't used my Berry yet. That leaves only Zatu, and of course, it's a one shot. Clean sweep for Bayonet. This was a really simple battle, definitely possible at the lower level. Now winning the battle 
battle against Tate and Liza gave me access to the Calm Mind TM, and I'm going to use this right before I take on Juan. I teach it in the place of Return, leaving my moveset as Shadow Ball, Thunderbolt, Calm Mind, and Shockwave. I equip a Person Berry, and then initiate battle with the final Gym Leader. Okay, this fight is so straightforward if you have a Person Berry and Calm Mind. Set up on the Love Disc until it confuses you, and then sweep the rest of his team using Thunderbolt. I get set up to plus 3, and from there things are really straightforward. Well, uh, if I don't make mistakes against the Whisk Cash. I choose Thunderbolt against this thing way too often just because I'm spamming A and not really paying attention. I can use Shadow Ball and just one-shot it anyways, even without stat boosts. The only other Pokemon on his team that's going to survive is the Kingdra maybe. It sets up double team, which is another reason to hold onto Shockwave until this fight. Still, with plus three, Thunderbolt, once it hits, does enough damage, and his ace faints. In Victory Road, Wally is not really worth talking about, but I will mention the fact that I pick up the Psychic TM. I think this special move will be useful as neutral damage when using Calm Mind. With that, Bayonet's ready for the Elite Four, but first, let's catch up with Dusclops. For Norman, I have Hidden Power Fighting. Really helpful here. I can one-shot the Spinda, one-shot the Vigoroth, and then against the slacking again I play safe against counter but this makes no sense. It cannot damage me because counter is a fighting type move which doesn't do anything to ghost types. This is only a minor inconvenience for Dusclops' time because eventually I still knock the slacking out and move on to his final Pokemon, the Linoon. Once it goes down, I've earned myself the fifth badge. Unlike Bayonet which got Thunderbolt, my Dusclops is going to get Ice Beam in the abandoned ship. While in general I would say an ice type move is better to have, remember that Dusclops' base special attack is 60 whereas Bayonet's is 83. This was one of the reasons why I wanted to go with Hidden Power Fighting on Dusclops. Its special attack is so low already, and while I'm sure at some point I will be using Calm Mind, I don't really want to be relying on it, and I would rather just have more consistent damage, especially throughout this section of the game. Inside the Fortree City Gym, I teach Ice Beam in the place of Thief, and now I'm ready for all the flying types here. I want to draw your attention to this battle with the Swellow and Zatu. These Pokemon are very fast, so they're moving first against Dusclops, which is not something that Bayonet has to manage. During these battles, Bayonet had 86 speed, which is enough to move first even against the Swellow. The fact that the enemy gets to move means that slightly more text prints and more HP gets animated, which slows things down even more. This is definitely death by a thousand cuts, which is probably why Dusclops looks like it has a bunch of bandages wrapped around it. Okay, now let's face Winona. This one's pretty simple. One shot with Ice Beam on the Swablu, one shot with Ice Beam on the Tropius. Then Pelipper comes in, it goes for Supersonic, luckily missing, but but it uses it again, confuses me, and then I hit myself twice, which is really annoying. Dusclops snaps out of confusion, Pelipper moves first, and confuses me. Ah, this thing. I hate this bird. One of the most frustrating NPC Pokemon to go up against in the entire Pokemon series. The only way they could make this thing worse is giving it Sand Attack. Imagine if its moveset was something like Supersonic, Protect, Confuse Ray, and Sand Attack. That would just be pure pain. Luckily it has things like Water Gun and Aerial Ace, but when's the last time we saw it use one of those moves. I think my brain is actually biased against those moves. Whenever it chooses them, I just delete it from my memory and really remember the supersonics and protects. Finally, it goes down to Skarmory's next. This thing takes a while to knock out because I don't have enough damage to two-shot, meaning she uses her hyper potion. Then I bring it back down to low health. Man, she uses another potion, so I have to chip away at it again. I probably should have used something like Shadow Punch or Hidden Power to do a little bit of damage, avoiding one of the potions. In the end, it doesn't matter. I survive with low health, Altaria is last, but my defenses are enough to survive its hit with Dragon Breath and use Ice Beam, which does four times damage. With Dusclops, I have to pick up the Shadow Ball TM if I want the chance to learn this move, because through level up, it only gets Shadow Punch. The whole time I've been recording this voiceover, I've been saying to myself, wouldn't it have been nice if Shadow Punch was a higher priority move? That way it could kind of counter out Dusclops' low speed. I think that would make this thing a lot better. Then maybe the trade-off between Shadow Ball on Bayonet and the lower base power on Shadow Punch but higher priority would would make Dusclops just a little bit more usable. But hey, the joke's on me, because Dusclops is in the overused tier on Smogon for Ruby and Sapphire. That's because it's a great staller with a moveset like Shadow Ball, Focus Punch, Will-O-Wisp, Pain Split, or Rest. Hey, 
a actually a competitive use for rest. That makes me really happy. Maybe I like Dust Clops more than I was giving it credit for. With it in the department store, I pick up four protein and then calcium instead of carbose because its speed, like I said before, is irredeemable. However, its defenses are fantastic, so using other defensive moves probably makes sense. At the top of the department store, on the roof, I can teach substitute to it in the place of shadow punch. This move is just so good in generation 3, I can't really emphasize that enough. Throughout this year I have been realizing all of the small niches that it solves. It essentially makes the enemy AI completely useless in so many different circumstances. I wouldn't blame you if you did your own solo challenges and decided to ban this move just because of how much it over centralizes the metagame. It is generation 3's equivalent of generation 2's curse. And uh, maybe generation 1's amnesia or sleep inducing moves? I'm not really sure. The metagame is not nearly as centralized in generation 1, things are a lot more diverse there. Maybe if I had to pick one move it would be Mimic because it does solve a lot of problems for most Pokemon. Unlike with Bayonet, Maxi turns out to be really simple to defeat. On the turn I choose Substitute, he sneaks in a Swagger boosting my attack, Dusclops eats its Person Berry, and then from behind my defenses I crush his team. On my way to the Aqua Hideout I pick up the TM for a rest. Maybe this will be useful later on. I can see in Dusclops case it actually helping out in combination with Substitute to make it so that the opponent can never defeat me. Just like with Bayonet, I level up to 53 in Tate and Liza's gym, and then I use Rare Candies. In this case I chose to use two more, bringing Dusclops up to level 60. I teach it Shadow Ball in the place of Return, and now I'm ready to earn myself a special attack and special defense boost. Okay, this fight is so straightforward. One shot the Clay Doll, then one shot the Lunatone, then one shot the Zatu so it doesn't confuse me, after that take care of the Soul Rock, and win. This win gives me a much needed boost to my special attack. In the plotline that follows, I'm able to pick up the Earthquake TM, but I'm not going to teach it to Dusclops right away. Ground moves are not that useful against the Elite Four, they tend to be really important for Steven Stone at the end of the game though, so we'll hang on to it for that. Now for Juan, I don't have access to Thunderbolt, and I'm not going to be using Calm Mind for this battle. Instead, I'll just be using Substitute. I get confused just before setting it up, but my Person Berry heals that. Then, I can block all status conditions with my newly established defenses. Shadow Ball is able to one-hit the Love Disk, but not the following Crawdont. It's attacking with Crab Hammer, I should have been using Hidden Power here, I figured that out, and then knock it out. I can't make mistakes against the Whiskash, which is really nice. Also, Shadow Ball does not one hit. Juan uses a Hyper Potion. Ah, buying time, but also getting another attack in because I'm slow. This breaks my substitute before I knock out the Whiskash. So against the Celio, I have to re-establish my defenses if I want them in place for the Kingdra. I've gotta say, this is probably one of the most interesting Juan fights I've had in recent times. Normally, I just spam setup moves and then knock out his entire team, or I don't spam setup moves and I just knock out his entire team anyways. He's generally not a very good gym leader. Sometimes I get stuck against the Kingdra because it does have Resto Chesto strats. But in this case with Dusclops, it doesn't even lose its substitute against his ace. So, Wands defeated, let's head to the league. During Victory Road, unlike with Bayonet, I'm going to skip the Psychic TM because I don't think I'm going to rely on special moves until the very end of the game. For now, Sydney's next, and I think Hidden Power Fighting is going to be enough for him. This is the time to use the White Herb to counter Intimidate. Then, against the Mighty Anna, I can set up with Substitute, but it squeezes in a Sand Attack first because of my low speed. What happens next I did not expect. Mighty Anna breaks my Substitute using a single Crunch. Okay, so this is a really bad start to this fight. Also, Hidden Power just barely does not one-shot. Are you kidding me? I tried to set up with Substitute more, hoping that it would just use Sand Attack, but it doesn't. As a result, I lose a bunch of health and then eventually just attack, and then it uses Sand Attack attack. Are you kidding me, Mighty Anna? Luckily, the next Pokemon Cacturn is much more simple. I knock it out in one hit, then Shift Tree moves first with a double team. I chose Ice Beam, which does one hit. His Crawdon sets up Swords Dance, and I fail to one hit with Hidden Power Fighting. Sydney uses a full restore. Hidden Power takes it back down to low health. Despite raising its attack, Crawdon cannot attack me with physical moves, so it uses Surf. Dusclops survives on 16 hit points and makes it to Sydney's ace. But Rock Slide is inaccurate, and it misses. However, the accuracy drops from earlier in the fight come through here for Sydney. Dusclops misses the key hidden power. Absol gets to roll Rock Slide again, and this time it hits. I'm so close to leveling up, I go back to Victory Road, fight a few wild Pokemon, level up to 65, and then Rare Candy to level 70. This gives me better damage rounding thresholds for all of Sydney's Pokemon, so now I can one-shot the Mighty Anna, which makes things more consistent. I still got hit by a single accuracy drop, but this time I didn't make the mistake of trying to set up with Substitute, so I have full health. That means I'm able to sweep through his team, 
team, one-shotting the Crawdont, as well as the final Absol. Okay, Phoebe is essentially going to be free. Substitute blocks her use of Curse. From there, I have Shadow Ball, which is super effective against every Pokemon except the Sableye. Galicia is next. This one's also fairly easy when using Substitute. While I do take chip damage from Hail, I can at least use Hidden Power Fighting for super effective damage against all of her Pokemon. What I didn't expect is the Glalie surviving my hit with Hidden Power. Once I finish it off, she sends in her second Glalie, which of course also survives. By this point, I have lost my Substitute. I re-establish it on the Celio, but then it sets up Hail, and the chip damage knocks Dusclops out. I try the fight again, and I'm still just not dealing enough damage. This time I make it slightly further, knocking the second Celio out, making it to the Wall Rain. But I'm on red health with no Substitute, so I'm not able to one-shot the Wall Rain, and that's a second reset. Ugh. Okay, so Glacia is more challenging than I was expecting. If I teach Rest, then I'll be able to heal. I want to keep Ice Beam for Drake who's next, and I want to keep Shadow Ball because it's my best damage dealing move. So I guess I need to give up Hidden Power because Substitute's also going to be great to keep around. This makes the battle against Glacia take significantly longer because I have to heal multiple times, but by doing this I am able to just barely squeeze out a win in my next battle. Having that fight take longer was worth it because then after establishing Substitute on Drake's Pokemon I can use Ice Beam to sweep all of them. Most of them take 4 times damage here. The Flygon, the Salamence, the Altaria. All that's left is Kingdra, but I can use Shadow Ball to two-shot it. Okay, for Wallace, I'm gonna unlearn Ice Beam and put Calm Mind in its place. This seems kind of strange initially because I don't have any special moves. Right now, I'm kicking myself for not picking up the Psychic TM. It would be useful here since he doesn't have any Dark-type Pokemon. But Calm Mind is still useful against Wallace because the defensive boosts means his water type moves will deal less and less damage to Dusclops. Honestly, Dusclops is so good defensively that I even get frozen against the Waylord from a Blizzard. I can just buy time, eventually defrost, then use Rest, Reset, Substitute, and eventually win. Or at least that's the theory, provided he's not going to get critical hits. The Tentacruel takes two hits to knock out. It does some damage to my Substitute, but it's not able to break it. Remember, your Substitute has 25% of your Pokemon's HP, and it uses your Pokemon's current stats to calculate damage. So if I get hit by a special move, it's going to use my outrageously high special defense, 990, to calculate the damage that my substitute takes. That's why it can survive so many hits here. Eventually Whiskash breaks it because it's using the physical move Earthquake, but I can just re-establish it, use rest, heal up my health, set up substitute again, and then knock the fish out. By the way, the rest there was not a good idea. I ended up with less health than I would have had if I had just attacked. When substitute Substitute is in place, Gyarados' Intimidate is foiled. As a result, I can knock it out with two uses of Shadow Ball and move on to the Milotic. It does not have a single physical move, so it really needs a crit if it wants to deal decent damage to Dusclops. That's actually like a tongue twister. Deal decent damage to Dusclops. The thing is, my Dusclops is very overleveled. The fast growth rate has been so handy in this playthrough. Even if it gets a critical hit, Dusclops is not going to lose. My Lodic goes down, and now there's only one trainer left. And the strategy that I am going to have to use against him is absolutely hilarious, and it uses a move that I very rarely find a niche for. Before I get to that though, let's see how Bayonet did with the League. Now remember, I had played Dusclops first, so I knew that I should be using Rare Candies before Sydney. In this case, I use all eight remaining, taking Bayonet up to level 71. Against the Mighty Anna, I can set up with Calm Mind essentially for free. I know that I have Shock Wave to bypass accuracy checks, so even if it attacks me with Sand Attack, I don't care. As I improve my special defense with my setup, Crunch is going to do less and less damage. Making things even better for me, the Mighty Anna is only going to start prioritizing Roar once one of my stats gets to plus 3. So, before that happens, I can just start attacking. At plus 2, I decide to sweep. Mighty Anna goes down to a single hit from Shock Wave. Then there's some Grass types for me to deal with. Both of them are annoying. The Cacturn takes two hits to knock out, but the Shift Tree just barely survives my second hit. He uses a full restore, which is annoying, just delaying my victory. Because once it goes down, the Crawdont is obviously a one hit, and the Absol was a little bit less clear to me, but it is a one hit with Shockwave. So that's that. Phoebe is also really straightforward. Calm Mind turn one. This boosts the power of Shockwave, just in case I need to use it against a Sableye that sets up with double team later into the battle. From there, Shadow Ball obliterates her team. The Sableye doesn't even get a chance to use double team. Okay, so Glacia is not actually going to be a problem. In this case, she has a lot of water 
types, so I can set up Calm Mind to turn 1 while Decelio goes for Hail, and then use Thunderbolt to knock out her lead. Note I have taught Hidden Power Fire in the place of Shockwave because I don't need to bypass accuracy checks anymore. Well, unless Ludicolo becomes a problem later on, but I assume with Calm Mind and Thunderbolt that that's not going to be an issue. Hidden Power Fire is helpful here against the Glalie, which I can both one-shot. Convenient, I make it through the final Celio, arriving at the wall rain, and Thunderbolt also gets the job done here with only plus one setup. Okay, so what about Drake? Because things are a lot less clear here when looking at Bayonet. Well, I'm going to set up with Calm Mind on the Shellgon until it uses Rock Tomb to lower my speed. I'm holding the White Herb to counter out this stat change, and then hopefully with my setup I'm going to be able to sweep. I fail to get the one shot on the Shellgon with Thunderbolt, it survives and uses Rock Tomb again, but luckily it misses, so my speed is intact. I know that Drake's going to use a Full Restore, so I'll squeeze in another Calm Mind before I use Thunderbolt again. But from here, my moves are not great. The Flygon's next, so I'm going to use Shadow Ball to knock it out. I barely don't have enough damage to one-shot. It uses Earthquake and does a decent amount of damage. I have two-thirds remaining. Flygon faints, then he sends in Salamence, and this one will take neutral damage from Thunderbolt. Also, it has Intimidate, so of course I should be using my special moves now. Here's a little factoid that I've never noticed before. The Salamence, the Altaria, and the Kingdra all have one typing that's weak to electric moves, and then another typing, the Dragon type, that resists them. Them. Now just because Thunderbolt has the damage to one-shot the Salamence doesn't mean it's also going to one-shot the Altaria and the Kingdra. They have higher special defense values. But of them, Altaria has the highest HP as well as special defense. And in this case, I'm able to get the one hit. So the Kingdra is a foregone conclusion. With that, I am ready to take on Wallace. And this one is pretty straightforward. I use Thunderbolt on the Waylord, hoping to take it to low health to avoid massive damage from Water Spout, but instead Bayonet just one-shots. Okay, so I, I guess I'm moving on to the Tentacruel. I should probably use Shadow Ball against it because it has massive special defense, and the Ghost-type move one-shots once again. Okay, Ludicolo. Uh, this is not the time to set up, so I'm going to attack, but Thunderbolt doesn't even do half. Then it gets seeded, things get really annoying because of double team. I hate this Pokemon. <laughs> is it going to ruin this for me? And uh, the answer is yes it is going to ruin this for me. Bayonet does make it past it, but with only 34 hit points. I take damage from Leech Seed, leaving me on 8 hit points, and from there I'm not able to knock out the Whisk Cash, and that's a loss. Okay, so instead of attacking the Wailord with Thunderbolt, I need to do less damage. Shadow Ball takes it to red health instead, and then I can set up Calm Mind while he uses a full restore. Notably here, when I set up with Calm Mind, because I have a physical move, I can consistently bring the Wailord to low health and continue my setup. Eventually, I'll just be so set up that I sweep Wallace's team for free, and at plus four I figured I had the damage I needed. Tentacruel, Ludicolo are both one hits. The Whiskash isn't, because I don't have a good move against it, so I have to two hit, and Wallace uses a full restore. Actually, two, buying a lot of time. But eventually I knock it out, move on to the Gyarados, it doesn't matter about Intimidate, Thunderbolt one-shots, as well as against his ace, Milotic. Both of our Pokemon have reached the end of the game, there's only one trainer left, and before I fight him, I'm gonna make a stop on the SS title to pick up the leftovers, a fantastic recovery item. Alright, with my current moveset, let's try Steven Stone and see how Bayonet does. His first Pokemon is Skarmory. This usually gives me a good opportunity to set up. The only problem is that it has Toxic and it likes to use this move if you don't have a status condition. I brought the Pecha Berry in to heal my status condition, but it goes for it first turn, so after only plus one setup, I decide to try to sweep. In this case, Thunderbolt does almost enough damage. It barely survives. Notice that I'm at level 74, with almost the exact amount of experience required to level up to 75. I'm pretty sure over the damage rounding threshold, I would have got the knockout. Still though, the Skarmory is going to go down, he uses a full restore, I get to reroll damage, this time still not knocking it out, but he does not heal it again. Metagross is next, I use Hidden Power Fire doing more than half, then it uses Shadow Ball, which does way more than half to Bayonet, and even though it has a Citrus Berry, I still have the damage required to knock it out. But Cradley that follows is very defensive. I decided to set up with Calm Mind here, hoping it would go for Ingrain, which it does. But with only plus two, Hidden Power Fire is not doing very much to the Cradley, and my special attack stat is much higher than my physical attack stat, so even though Shadow Ball has a higher effective power, I still think I made the right choice. Cradley uses Ancient Power, and Bayonet faints. Okay, obviously fight one wild Pokemon, this Soul Rock, level up to 75, and then try the fight again. 
Maybe Skarmory won't use Toxic so early into the battle. Instead, it can prioritize something like Spikes. This allows me to get set up to plus two before attacking. Now I have a guaranteed one hit on the Skarmory with Thunderbolt. Metagross goes down over two hits with Hidden Power, but I'm still left on orange health by the time the Cradley comes in. I didn't try to go for Calm Mind again, just choosing Hidden Power against it, but I do like a third. This is not very inspiring damage. And once again, the Fossil Pokemon knocks me out. Okay, so in the next fight, I decide to push things. I get Poison into turn one, which was frustrating, so I just spam Calm Minds, and it actually does not poison me again, choosing Spikes, and then choosing Steel Wing, which does about a quarter. This let me get set up to plus three, but that's not a great position against the Metagross, because it's going to do massive damage to Bayonet. Well, unless Hidden Power Fire at plus three has enough damage to one shot, and it does. Okay, so against Cradley, I'm going to go for Hidden Power Fire. I crit on the turn it sets up Ingrain. Steven uses a full restore. I crit again. I can't believe it. He uses another full restore. I don't get a lucky crit this time, so it squeezes in one ancient power before I knock it out. But I still have roughly half health for the remainder of the battle. I've kept Shadow Ball on my moveset just so I can one shot the Claydol. But you know what? It survives just barely and sets up Reflect. Okay, honestly, quite annoying. I set up another Calm Mind. Then I go for Shadow Ball again, which is now going to two hit. And then the Claydol does something which is worse. It sets up Light Screen, improving the defenses of the following Pokemon. I felt like here I needed to use more Calm Minds to improve my special attack because I don't want to be taking damage from the remaining Pokemon. Plus, if it can stall out the screen, then I'll have a better chance. This allows the Claydol to go for Earthquake, taking me down to red health. Okay, I just have to try to knock stuff out now. Claydol goes down, and next Steven Stone sends in Aggron. Let's just quickly look through its moveset. Thunder, Earthquake, Solar Beam, and Dragon Claw. Obviously, Earthquake knocks me out, but it chooses Solar Beam. I don't know why. As a result, I get two turns, and I can take it down. The Solar Beam also helped me out because it stalled out Light Screen. It fades right before I deal damage to the Armaldo, which I do with Thunderbolt, and this does enough damage. Bayonet clocks in with a first playthrough time of 1 hour 37 minutes and 20 seconds, with 6 resets at level 76, with a game time of 6 hours and 3 minutes. Okay, I want all of you to ask yourselves a question. Looking at these results, how do you feel like Bayonet did in comparison with other Pokemon that I've run in the past? Personally, I have improved a lot in Emerald recently, and looking at these results, I was not particularly impressed. Bayonet's time just didn't seem very good. Well, then I brought up my tier list, and I looked at Soul Rock, who is in first place. Its first run had a time of 1 hour 35 minutes and 24 seconds. And the second place spot, Medicham, had a time of 1 hour 37 minutes and 27 seconds. Bayonet currently earns itself the second place spot in my first attempt tier list. It's worth remembering that this tier list is mostly ranked based on how I've performed as a player in the game, rather than how the Pokemon perform individually. That's why my final rankings are always based on follow-up attempts, because I want to rank on something that's a little bit more objective, or if I make a mistake, I can come back and revise my results later on. If I was always ranking based on first attempts, then it would be stuck with this, and that just doesn't make sense with Mewtwo and Rayquaza being further down on the list. Honestly, even Dusclops is probably going to beat at least one of their results today because it's not a terrible Pokemon. Before Steven Stone, I feed it three rare candies, bringing it up to level 77. Then I reteach it Hidden Power Fighting, as well as Earthquake. So my moveset now is Hidden Power Fighting, Earthquake, Rest, and Substitute. The last of these moves is fantastic against the Skarmory, and I probably should have run it with Bayonet. Like I said before, Substitute really messes the AI up. They have no idea that it's in place. As a result, the Skarmory will sometimes waste its turn with Toxic once I have my defense set up. The thing is, I'm just not doing very much damage with Hidden Power Fighting. Also, I can't really leverage the fact that it might spam Toxic over and over again with a setup move like Calm Mind. Overall, I don't really like this strategy, and I tried to play it out, but eventually I just realized this is not going to work, so I reset. I go back to the game corner so I can buy coins and purchase myself another Ice Beam TM. This way, I can now try the set Ice Beam, Calm Mind, Rest, and Substitute against Steven. I can leverage Toxic to set up with Calm Mind, then Ice Beam for special damage, and Rest and Substitute for defense. This strategy is also flawed though, because Ice Beam just doesn't do very much damage to the Metagross. I'm not able to two hit once I get to plus six. 
This makes me really grateful that I did not run a modest nature on my Dusclops. That would have been disastrous here. Even with a nature that affects my special attack neutrally though, I'm just not able to two hit. Because of that, Steven's using full restores and Shadow Ball does so much damage, so Dusclops takes another reset. I thought maybe I would win if I could freeze the Metagross, but after another loss, I decided to try an alternative. What about teaching Earthquake in the place of Substitute? I can live through the Skarmory because Dusclops naturally has good defenses, and I can use Rest to heal the status condition if I get hit by Toxic. My idea was that maybe Earthquake's gonna do more damage and allow me to two hit the Metagross, but no, it just barely doesn't have enough damage. Okay, so look at the timer. Yeah, Dusclops not doing very well. But there is an option that I have available to me that will solve the Metagross, and it doesn't involve me leveling up to say 80 or 83 where I'm gonna get the guaranteed two shot. I figured this strategy out while I was leveling up. I make it to level 80, and then I go back to the move reminder and teach Future Sight in the place of Substitute. Okay, so here's how this works. I set up on the Skarmory, then before knocking it out, I'm going to establish Future Sight. This calculates damage based on the Skarmory and based on my Dusclops. In this case, not very effective damage, but that's all right. Next, he's going to send in Metagross, which has higher special defense, so it's going to take more damage from Future Sight. The idea here is that it's a one-two punch. I'm going to combo Ice Beam's damage with Future Sight's damage and hopefully knock the Metagross out in one hit. Strangely, because I'm a higher level, it chooses Meteor Mash, like Okay, Ice Beam does less than half, and I actually freeze the Metagross. Are you kidding me? Anyways, Future Sight deals its damage, and this is enough to knock out Steven's ace. From there, I'm fully set up, but remember, Claydol is slow. So Cradley moves first, does some damage before I take it out with Ice Beam. Next is Claydol. It gets to attack with Earthquake, taking me down to around two-thirds remaining health before I finish it off. Agron's next, and once again it chooses Solar Beam. It really loves this move. That gives me time to attack but it's actually able to hit a solar beam because it's faster. And uh, look at how much damage it does with my defense setup. Almost nothing. As a result, Steven's second to last Pokemon goes down and all that's left is Armaldo. It chooses Ancient Power, which does not do nearly enough, and Dusclops knocks it out with Ice Beam. In my first playthrough, I get a time of 2 hours, 21 minutes, and 51 seconds with 23 resets and 0 blackouts at level 82 with a game time of 7 hours and 55 minutes. Okay, obviously Bayonet's faster, but Dusclops wins in my heart because it got to use Future Sight, and any time I use a weird niche move like that, it always feels awesome. That's one of the reasons I love these solo challenges. It makes me think about every move and try and use every small thing to get an advantage with the Pokemon I'm currently running. For example, recently I used Roar in Pokemon Crystal, which was really unique and fun. Anyways, while Dusclops wins in my heart, it doesn't get a good placement in the tier list. I ended up being wrong, it is not able to beat either Rayquaza or or Mewtwo's old results. In this case, it earns a placement in the D tier just behind Breloom and ahead of Salamence. That's actually kind of a fun comparison. The reason that Salamence is so lowly ranked is because it didn't get access to Dragon Dance. That move is an egg move for it. Okay, so now let's look at the data from these first two Ghost playthroughs and see where each of them needs to improve for their follow-ups. First of all, I just want to say, Dusclops uh, doesn't really have a chance. Look at these splits comparisons. Bayonet is just in a completely different class. Where Pokemon like Lunatone and Solrock were very well balanced with each other as version exclusives, these two really aren't. As is the case with my formula, I like to play the Pokemon I think is advantaged first, so I'm going to start by doing Bayonet's follow-up playthroughs. The spots to fix up are Watson, Flannery, Wallace, and Steven. I think of these four, the worst definitely for Bayonet was Flannery. And in my second playthrough with Bayonet, there was also a trainer that didn't cause problems in the first run, and I didn't expect would cause problems in the second run, but he ended up being an absolute nightmare. I'll talk about him when we get there. For now, let's talk about Roxanne. I did some calculations here to see what level would be required to two-shot the Geodudes with Nightshade, and it turns out to be 17, which is just way too high. At level 13, I just barely get the three-hit KOs on all of her Pokémon, so that's the level I'm going into this fight at. And winning this way is very easy. I did experiment with trying to beat her at a lower level, like 11, and it is possible, but it's much less likely, so I reverted to the more consistent strategy. After all, I need a lot of levels to make Watson consistent. For him, I want level 30 to two-shot KO the Magneton, which has 59 HP. But before that, I need to talk about a nuisance that happens inside the Trick House. This trainer is Robin, and she is absolutely awful as we saw earlier in the year when I played Pokemon like Relicanth and Wailord. In this case with Bayonet, she's equally bad. Leech Seed drains so much health, I'm paralyzed, everything falls apart, and I have to black out against her Meryl, which takes quite a while because my HM users all have to faint to a weak Pokemon. Anyways, this 
his blackout is definitely a setback in this playthrough, but it wasn't enough for me to restart entirely. I figured if this is the only thing that goes wrong, like, I'll be fine with this playthrough. But uh, this is not the only thing that goes wrong. Remember, there is one trainer that comes out of nowhere and destroys this run. He's coming up soon. And you might expect it to be Watson, because usually he's really bad in these solo challenges, but in this case he isn't. As long as I don't get bad paralysis luck, I'm going to win this fight if I'm level 30. I don't need to level up more and waste time. In my second playthrough, I defeat him on my first attempt. Okay, with him completed, now let's talk about hidden power. I thought for a long time about how to beat Flannery in the most efficient way. Physical moves just don't really cut it, and in the late game I'm planning to use special moves against Steven Stone again, just because of how good Thunderbolt is. If Bayonet had access to Earthquake, maybe that would be an option with its incredibly high attack stat, but in this case I decided on special moves for the late game, and to aid them I went with a special attack boosting nature, Rash. This lowers my special defense. I thought about using Hidden Power Ground as sort of a weaker version of Earthquake, but this doesn't really help with damage ranges against Steven Stone later in the game. But Hidden Power Water both helps with Steven Stone after Calm Mind, and it also helps here against Flannery. This battle is so simple with this move, I one-shot the Nummel, the Slugma, the Camerupt of course, and then I'm able to two-hit the Torkoal. So with my fourth badge, this playthrough is going really well, zero resets and only the one slightly annoying blackout earlier on. And that's where everything went off the rails, at the most unexpected trainer, Norman. He's who I was referring to before. I figured because I'm a ghost type, I wouldn't have problems against him, but three of his four Pokemon have moves that can hit ghost types. Spinda has Psybeam, Vigoroth and Slacking both have Faint Attack. But this isn't actually the problem. The problem is I'm a lower level because I didn't need to overlevel for Flannery with Hidden Power Water. Because of that, and because of my attack lowering nature, I can't one-shot the Spinda with Return. This gives it time to either confuse me, which forces me out of the Silk Scarf into an item like the Person Bear, or it gives it a chance to deal chip damage with Psybeam. Now, all of this gets really strange at the slacking. Sometimes it loves to spam Faint Attack and knock my Bayonet out, giving me multiple resets. Other times, it just spams Yawn, even though it sees my ability as Insomnia. In Generation 3, the AI doesn't know what your ability is until it first gets triggered. For example, we see this very often with Pokémon that have Levitate, where the enemy will use a Ground-type move against them, and then cease using the Ground-type move once they've seen Levitate. But in this case, with Insomnia, it just doesn't seem like Yawn is triggering the AI to wake up and realize that it shouldn't use this move. So in some cases, the slacking just continuously spams the status move and I can knock it out. In the end though, the Norman battle alone convinced me to do a third playthrough because four resets against the normal type specialist is unacceptable with a ghost. If you're wondering why I chose the special attack boosting nature, I will reference it later with the Steven damage ranges, but just know that it really isn't required. I can luck through certain portions of the Steven fight with slightly substandard damage ranges, and improve my attack stat so that Norman is more consistent in the third run. Okay, I'm gonna make a big jump ahead now before Tate and Liza. For this battle, I did not use any rare candies this time. At level 50, Bayonet has no problem against their psychic types. This will allow me to get a slightly higher level by the end of the game, and that is important to boost Thunderbolt's damage ranges against Steven Stone. This time I don't have Hidden Power Fire, so in terms of type coverage, I'm a little bit worse off, but I will still be able to manage. I initially planned to use my rare candies before Sydney because he has a technical type advantage over Bayonet, but I should have used them before Juan, because without a higher level here, I don't have the damage ranges to knock out his Pokemon. You will note that I am using Substitute on my moveset at this point. This move is fantastic in Generation 3, and I have held off on teaching Calm Mind because I only want to use it for the late game. When I initially ran damage calculations at the slightly higher level, I found out that I didn't need to set up for Juan, and that felt far more consistent. However, I didn't recheck the damage ranges at a lower level, I just figured Juan is bad enough for me to not focus on him. This was a mistake, and he does give Bayonet a reset. Ah, <sighs> this run is not going very well. And it actually gets worse. I, I can't believe I'm saying that. I lost to Juan, I lost to Norman, I lost to Robin. Who else could possibly cause Bayonet problems? The answer is Wally. Yes, Wally. Because of his Magneton. If I'm not setting up, I don't have good damage against it because of my moves type coverage. This steel thing is just really annoying. Anyways, I decided not to reset here and just black out once again, wasting a lot more time. Coming back into the cave, I fight wild Pokemon leveling up to 55, and then I use my rare candies. If these had been before Juan, it would have solved the Wally problem as well. Oh well, from there things are actually really easy. Substitute is great against Sydney. Shadow Ball absolutely destroys 
destroys Phoebe. You might be worried about Bayonet against Glacia because I no longer have a fire type move. This is irrelevant though because Shadow Ball does a ton of damage to the Glalie. Although just barely not enough to one shot, this is another fight where I really want to have slightly more attack. So again, I think I went with the wrong nature for my second playthrough. Okay, let's talk about Drake. This one is really simple. Set up Substitute, then the Shell Gone can't really do much damage to me, and I can set up Calm Mind in the safety of my defenses. Once I make it by the Flygon, I have neutral damage with Thunderbolt, so the rest of his Pokemon aren't an issue. Okay, Wallace is kind of free. I just set up Calm Mind here. It misses Blizzard, so I squeeze in an extra one. I didn't think I was going to take this. Even Water Spout isn't doing very much damage. And once I get to plus three, I knock out the Whale Lord, set up against the Tentacruel because it loves to use Toxic, and then I sweep the rest of his team. While I'm doing that, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that I'm using the Lax Incense as my held item. This is available right after you pick up the Shadow Ball TM, so in most cases it's pretty off the beaten path. But in this case, when I was grabbing the TM anyways, I figured I'd pick this item up because it lowers the opponent's accuracy by 5%, which means all of their moves are just slightly less consistent. When you don't have a better item to hold, this is a great catch-all solution. I learned it from Mike the Killer, so thank you again for him posting all of his runs over on my solo challenge Discord. Every time he clocks in with a result, I learn something about the game. In some cases, it's a small thing like the Lax Incense, and in other cases, it's more of a major strategical shift, which you can see here against Steven Stone. In so many of my runs, I really prioritize having a setup move here and rest for the Skarmory's Toxic, or I run the Pecha Berry. But there's something else you can do. Substitute is fantastic at messing the Skarmory's AI up, because it still loves to use moves like Toxic even when you have your defense in place. Plus the fact that it likes to use spikes on at least one turn in the battle means that you're going to get some free turns to set up behind your defense. Also, Steelwing may fail to knock out the substitute, or it can miss because this move has imperfect accuracy. In general, even if you don't heal, leftovers will recover enough health while Skarmory spams toxic in most cases, allowing me to get set up. I have one reset here because the Skarmory just attacks. I should have reset slightly faster to save time when I realized the fight was not going my way. In the next battle, everything works out. I set up all the way to plus six, and now let's go through the damage ranges on the rest of Steven's team. My two damage dealing moves are Hidden Power Water and Thunderbolt. At plus 6 from Calm Mind, Thunderbolt one-shots the Skarmory, and Thunderbolt has a 70.7% chance of knocking the Metagross out in one hit. This is primarily the reason I wanted a special attack raising nature, just so I would avoid this thing's Shadow Ball. But if I have Substitute in place, then it doesn't really matter, because beyond that the rest of the fight is quite easy. Hidden Power Water 2 hits the Cradley, and 1 hits the Claydol, the Agron, and the Armaldo. In my second run, I clock in with a time of 1 hour 28 minutes and 33 seconds seconds, with 6 resets, 2 blackouts at level 76. Overall, it's a fine result, but obviously I need to do better. Going back in, the 5 trainers that I want to clean up are Robin, Norman, Juan, Wally, and Steven a little bit. If I could get better luck there against the Skarmory and have no resets, that would be better than this run. So what can be done better for the follow-up playthrough? I think running a Naughty Nature again is going to be far better to one-hit KO Norman Spinda. If I rare candy before Juan, as I said before, I solve him as well as Wally. I'm not going to lose to Robin, what's the chance of that? I will have a cherry berry for that fight just to prevent it. And I'm pretty sure, I'm confident actually, I'm gonna get better luck against Steven Stone. So let's see how my third playthrough went. And now that I've filmed it, the answer is not very good. I'm really disappointed with what happened. Although I was far more frustrated by Dusclops' follow-up playthroughs, but th that's something I have to cover later on. Let's talk about Bayonet 3 now, like I said we were going to. The biggest problem in the early to mid game that I wanted to solve was Norman. He surprised me in the previous playthrough, but I have a really straightforward approach for him. I'm going to be switching back from a rash nature to a naughty nature that I had during my first playthrough. This way I'm boosting my attack and lower my special defense, and it's a little bit less good for the late game, but that doesn't matter as much. I would rather beat Norman on my first attempt. Plus, I'm going to level up a little bit more over the damage rounding threshold at level 38, and then I'm also going to take in return to this battle for maximum damage in combination with the Silk Scarf. By doing this, I'm able to one-shot the Spinda, so I'm never going to get confused. I take some damage from Vigoroth, waste one of his Hyper Potions here, and then move on to the Slacking. Now, because it likes to use Yawn sometimes, even though I have Insomnia, I am going to win here eventually. 
quickly. But I also want to draw your attention to something else. Because of how much damage I'm doing, I can line things up so he uses his other hyper potion when slacking would be attacking. This actually removes its attack entirely and then it just loafs on the next turn. As a result, I get a lot of attacks in in a row and eventually his ace faints. No resets for Bayonet against the normal type specialist. So this run is going pretty good. What could possibly go wrong? And the answer starts at Wallace. I did not expect to one-hit his Wailort. I hadn't memorized that damage range and didn't go for Shadow Ball for less damage. I do one-hit it and then I have to fight against the Tentacruel where I want to set up with Calm Mind to sweep the rest of his team. Yeah, this ends up being a player-induced reset. I come back and beat him after one reset. But then the run really starts to fall apart against Steven Stone. This fight is always to some extent random. If he's breaking my substitute consistently with a Skarmory and trying to poison me with Toxic when it's not established, then things are going to go wrong. Remember though, this strategy does have the ability to be extremely fast. I could have no resets here, get set up to plus 6, and then sweep his team. It looked like that was about to happen in my first battle against him, but then I get poisoned, so this is a reset. And it's not the only one, so let's count the resets to Steven. This is the second one, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and that's luckily it for a total of nine resets in this third playthrough. Everything fell apart right at the end of the game. I didn't get the luck that I needed. And now the run clocks in with a final time of one hour, 28 minutes and 13 seconds. Only 20 seconds faster than my second attempt. Granted, I did improve some of the other metrics. I had no blackouts this time. I finished the game two levels lower and my game time is only five hours and 13 minutes. So that's a dramatic time savings compared to the second run. When I went into filming the final run with Bayonet, I expected that there would be some randomness. After all, I'm going for a fairly risky strategy against Steven Stone, and it just didn't work out for me. As Exceptional sometimes says to me, it's game day, so this is what happened, and I'm going to have to deal with this being Bayonet's final result for the tier list, at least for now. By the way, whenever I say final result in the tier list, I really just mean until whenever I get around to playing this Pokemon again. Alright, now let's talk about Dusclops. This one is kind of hilarious. It feels like a Pokemon Pokemon that is engineered, designed to frustrate me. In the early game, we have terrible coverage with awful inaccurate moves like Bind. This makes fighting any of the early game normal types really annoying, specifically these people who have Zigzagoon. They also have full restores because they are rich trainer classes. And so after you grind away with Bind, they just heal and then you have to do it all over again. Plus Zigzagoon has Growl so it can lower your physical attack, making Bind do truly pathetic amounts of damage. Now the math for Roxanne is very interesting. The Nose Pass has 37 hit points. So as I said before with Bayonet, if I want a 3 hit with a Nightshade, I need to be level 13. Although with Dusclops, I found things were a little bit different here. It doesn't get hit by as many Rock Tombs because its speed goes under the threshold sooner than it would have with Bayonet. Also, Roxanne's using her potions on Geodudes. If I went to level 14, then I would 2-shot after the use of the potion, whereas I 3-shot after the use of the potion at the current level. Still, at level 13, I am able to get a win because Nose Pass just does doesn't know that it should be using Rock Tomb. Now I'm not free from the early game awfulness yet because watch this battle against Hiker Devon. Um, I have Bind, Nightshade, and Rock Tomb as my damage dealing moves at this point, but I have run out of Nightshade fighting Roxanne. I forgot to go back to the center to heal, and now I have to use Rock Tomb to knock out this Geodude which is spamming Defense Curl because Tackle does no damage to Ghost Pokemon. This is even worse than fighting the Zigzagoon using Bide. Also if I use Leer to lower its defense then it just spams Defense Curl and raises its defense again and we we all just waste time. This battle is awful. Uh, Dusclops is so terrible in the early game. Like, it's a ghost type. Usually ghost types do really well in the early game, but this thing is just like so frustrating. Plus it gets Rock Tomb. It's like, wow, that's amazing. So much better than Bind. But no, we can just miss all the time. Also, miss with our very last PP against the Team Aqua Grunt with Poochiena. So then I have to knock this Pokemon out with Bind. I am losing my mind. I'm going to skip ahead to Watson now, and I want you to know that this is not my final playthrough with Dusclops, because after what happens at Watson, I was left kind of discouraged. Although, I didn't restart. I was like, no, it's not that bad. I do have two resets here, and these are purely based on luck. Early into the fight, each time, the Voltorb or the Electric can paralyze me. The Electric can only do it if I attack in with Astonish into its static, but if I attack with Nightshade, then I'm safe. 
The Voltorb, on the other hand, can use Spark, but it could also use Shockwave. In this case, if it chooses Spark and paralyzes me, then I'm going to be paralyzed for the rest of the fight, and it's going to be much less easy for me to win. At exactly level 30, I two-shot the Magneton and three-shot the Manectric using Nightshade, so I felt leveling up more made absolutely no sense. Plus, his Pokemon are fairly fast, and Dusclops is never going to be moving first. In the third battle, I get the luck I need, and I defeat the Electric-type Specialist. Okay, this is where this run gets hype. I go into the Gondola, and there it is, the hiker that I've been waiting for. I have only ever on this channel seen the camper, so now we have seen both of them. And I was so excited to include this playthrough in the video just because of this fact. And then I get to the top of Mount Chimney, I open my bag, teach hidden power, and it's hidden power fighting like in my first playthrough. I forgot to change the drop down menu on my overlay that gives me hidden power fire. So now I'm sitting here with the wrong hidden power type and that is going to make Steven Stone absolutely brutal. Hidden power fire makes him pretty easy and uh, yeah I decided to restart the run and try all over again. So I have to make it through the drudgery of the early game with Dusclops. I was not very happy about this. Now just to increase the sense of impending doom I want to remind you that I was very very tired when doing this follow-up run. But this time, Watson goes really well. I beat him on my first attempt. Fantastic. Since we've made it by him, I want to go through and talk about a bunch of items that I'm picking up, like the Dig TM, the Roar TM, this Carbos, this Protein. Then I loop around grabbing this PP up on the other side of Meteor Falls, and I also pick up this HP up at the other side of Rust Turf Tunnel. Even outside of this location, I go into the little contest hall area where I very rarely visit, and I pick up the Attract TM. This is so I can sell all of these items, get enough money, and purchase the TM for Psychic from the game corner. As you saw in my first playthrough, Flannery was quite difficult, and I'm going to be using this move against her in combination with Thief for a much more reliable battle. I make a small mistake in my tired stupor here. I use Psychic on the Nummel, but it survives this move. I should be using Shadow Punch, which has a guaranteed one hit. I can also use the Ghost move to one hit the Slugma, and then two shot the camera up that follows. It sets up Sunny Day, but this won't allow the Torkoal to knock me out with a single overheat. First, I am going to Thief the White Herb from it, and I am faster than the Slow Turtle, which is really convenient. Then, its special attack is lowered, and as a result it can't knock Dusclops out anymore. And Psychic is really good because it two shots from here, giving her much less time. Okay, so recently I have started doing a new process while I'm optimizing these playthroughs. Instead of just writing a little notepad document on my computer, I'm actually writing physical notes on my iPad. For some reason, the act of committing something to paper using a pen and a paper substitute, for some reason seems to manipulate my brain, and I remember these roots far better. I wrote beside Norman a small sad face, because I wasn't really sure how I was going to beat him. Like, I could dramatically overlevel for this battle, but without hidden power fighting, I'm a little bit at a loss here. And just like with Bayonet, I have two resets against the normal type specialist until I eventually beat him. Really, if we want to break down my strategy, what I'm hoping for here is a special defense drop with Psychic while I attack the Slacking, and then I should be able to knock it out. Unfortunately, Dusclops can be hit by Yawn and go to sleep, so when that happens, things don't go particularly particularly well. But two resets isn't the end of the world. I did make it through the early game with no resets, so I'm going to continue playing. The next key to a successful Dusclops playthrough is picking up Ice Beam so that you have super effective damage against Winona. Now, I thought that I was picking up Ice Beam because I go to the abandoned ship and I grab the storage key, and then I just, uh, I just leave the abandoned ship without picking up Ice Beam. This is what happens when you're too tired. Now, I didn't realize until I was standing in front of Winona that I had forgot the Ice Beam TM, so let's try her without it. And I really want to point out that this is not going to work. Her first Swablu loves using Parish Song when you're a ghost type. I think this has something to do with its only damage dealing move being Aerial Ace. I have never seen it go for Parish Song this number of times in a row. Realizing this, I am going to go back to the early game once again and have to play with Bind and Nightshade. Dusclops, please, please let this be the final run. After all of my experience in this section of the game, I noticed a few nuances. On the first route, I can fight Calvin and then this guy who has two worm pull. But I'm going to skip the next guy because his tailo has peck, which is scary, as well as the next girl because she has a zigzagoon. I'm also going to skip the two rich trainers with zigzagoons, and even though I need their money, I can get them after I've obtained Rock Tomb, instead fighting the trainers that don't have normal types so that I can get quick wins with Nightshade. Rather than fighting the trainers in Roxanne's gym right away, I go north of the gym and battle three trainers getting more experience 
experience before coming back to the gym and fighting the Geodude trainers. This doesn't get me quite to level 14. I could have battled one wild Pokemon to get there, but it's not a huge deal. Once I knock out the first Geodude, then I'll have the better damage range for the second one using Nightshade, and that'll mean that I take one less turn of damage. Also, I'm going to draw your attention to the fact that I'm using the Quick Claw in the early game, and throughout this second playthrough, I am basically just going to stick the Quick Claw on Dusclops and use some super glue so that it stays there. This is a fantastic held item for the majority of the playthrough. I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty happy. I beat Watson on my first attempt. By the way, a key aspect of this strategy is thieving the Citrus Berry from the Manectric. This way, Dusclops survives long enough even though it's paralyzed. Alright, I didn't really have good footage of fighting Maxi, but I want to talk about him because he was really problematic during my first playthrough. In this case, Hidden Power Fire solves him as a problem because it two shots the Mighty Enna, making it so much faster, and its bites are doing a lot of damage, plus I get my accuracy lowered by two stages, but even then with Psychic, I now have a really reliable move to do massive damage to the Zubat as well as the Camerupt. Although I'm using Shadow Punch here because it bypasses accuracy. In this playthrough I trained more, so I've arrived at Norman at a higher level. I'm using a Person Berry so that I can heal the Spinda's Confusion, and then I'm going to use Thief for the Slacking Citrus Berry. By the way, turn one Psychic just in case it lowers Special Defense, then my Thief would have done more damage. In this case I don't get a Special Defense drop, which is really frustrating. Norman uses a bunch of potions, but with this Citrus Berry I'm able to hang on long enough, Dusclops gets a critical hit, and his only Pokemon left over is Linoon with no moves that hit ghosts. Okay, against Winona, I remembered Ice Beam, so I now have Hidden Power Fire for the Skarmory and Ice Beam for essentially everything else. In Mount Pyre, I make a small mistake. Wobbuffet guy catches me. Luckily, Shadow Punch knocks it out in one hit. By the way, I only had a 47% chance to, but luckily for me, Counter can't hit ghosts, so I would have been fine. Anyways, I want to draw your attention to my nature, which is quiet in this case. I resigned myself to the fact that running Psychic in the mid game and other moves like Hidden Power Fire and Ice Beam in the late game, it made more sense to boost my special attack than my physical attack. This really hurts, because Shadow Ball is fantastic on Dusclops and I wish I could have boosted its damage, but after I beat Tate and Liza, which I don't need the boost for, I'm going to be running an exclusively special set utilizing Calm Mind. And an additional aspect of this strategy is that in the early game, you're really not using your physical attack if you avoid all the normal types like I did here. Instead, I'm just using Nightshade, which does fixed damage. So after considering everything, I think the quiet nature synergizes best with Dusclops for a solo challenge. Ah, uh, in Pokemon Emerald, of course. I'm always trying to be really specific with my voiceover, but sometimes I say something like, for Dusclops in solo runs, use a quiet nature, and then people are like, but in Generation 4, that's not what it should do. I have no idea, I'm just talking about Emerald in this video. Okay, substitute in the place of Hidden Power, then Shadow Ball in the place of Shadow Punch. If this gets me through the next little section of the game, Tate and Liza are quite frankly awful. I could see it being realistic to just skip Shadow Ball entirely. It might not be needed. I just wanted the extra damage for a bunch of little battles that I'm doing. Also, you will note that my level is 63 by this point. That's because I used 12 rare candies before Tate and Liza to increase my level and make it just a little bit easier, plus everything that comes after it. I don't need an absurdly high level for Steven Stone now that I'm running Hidden Power fire. Throughout the entire Elite Four, I run Calm Mind Substitute, Psychic, and Ice Beam. Ice Beam for Sydney, Psychic or Ice Beam for Phoebe, Psychic for Glacia, Ice Beam for Drake, and then Psychic for Wallace. Although I make one small mistake here, I forget to teach Rest in the place of Substitute for the Champion. Now I didn't reset right away when I realized my mistake, because it is possible to beat him with Substitute, it's just less likely. The reason is, is that the Whale Lord is going to do a lot of damage while I'm setting up, not giving me time. And in this case I get quite unlucky, because Blizzard freezes. By the way, the Waylord is only going to be able to use Water Spout and Blizzard three times each because I have the ability Pressure. So the fact that it freezes me is quite unlikely. After it depletes those moves, it's going to start spamming Double Edge, which does nothing. So setting up against it is mostly trivial. Even if you're running Substitute, I just got very unlucky here. In my next battle, I set up Fully and then Dispatch Wallace. Okay, I had five more Rare Candies, so now I'm level 78 to face Steven Stone. This level is so I don't get KO'd by the Skarmory followed by the Metagross's Shadow Ball. The setup here is really simple with rest, it is far better than substitute. That move is not good against Steven Stone in this case, because the Skarmory is faster, so it can just put Toxic down before you ever get set up. Also, the ability to heal means I can take as much time as I want against Skarmory, because it's never going to KO me using Steel Wing, even if it crits. 
With plus six, Hidden Power and Ice Beam have perfect coverage against his entire team. I will one-shot every member, including the Metagross. This is why Hidden Power is so important. When it goes down, I'm going to be on low health, but the Cradley likes to use Ingrain turn one, so I can one-shot it with Ice Beam. And I can also one-shot the Claydol while it sets up Reflect. For whatever reason, it just didn't like going for Light Screen when I was playing against it, so that's really convenient. Next is Agron, and this is where things get a little bit nuanced. I found that getting hit once by the Agron and then the Armaldo sometimes led to a loss. So I use Rest here to heal because the Agron can waste time with a move like Solar Beam, which does almost nothing to Dusclops. Because of this, I have enough health that I can then survive Armaldo's hit when it comes in, and I defeat Steven Stone. In Dusclops' follow-up, I get a time of 1 hour, 37 minutes, and 30 seconds, with one reset, no blackouts, at level 79. This is a game time of 6 hours and 17 minutes. Let's go through some of the data. Putting all of Bayonet's playthroughs side by side, you can see that in the third run, I really just wasted time at Steven, everything else was more efficient. I'm pretty happy with my improvements in its run, but I'm not overall that thrilled with its finish time. I think it's an okay Pokemon, but it struggles in the early game because of its moveset, and Dusclops is more of the same. Looking at its timeline graphs is a little bit funny. It seems like the second run is so much faster, and yes it is, especially the Steven Stone split, although Dusclops time when ranked against other Pokemon is still not great. Putting these two Pokemon side by side, it's pretty clear that Bayonet has a major advantage. In its final run, it beats Steven Stone faster than I beat Wallace with Dusclops, and that would have been the case even if I didn't make the one small mistake there. And there's a lot more upside for Bayonet because it could have a clean Steven Stone. One day, I'll come back and try to get that, but for now, we're just going to rank these two Pokemon in the tier list. I am really overplaying the early game with Ghost types, and so because of that, I'm going to come back tomorrow to do a backport run of Cofadrigus in Pokemon Emerald. Uh, if you thought these two were painful, that one is gonna be even worse. With Bayonet's results, today it earns itself a placement in the A tier behind Hariyama. Overall, not a bad placement in the tier list, but it is gonna get shuffled around later in the year when I redo all of the thresholds. Dusclops, on the other hand, doesn't help us break the tier list up. It earns itself a placement between Spinda and Chimeko in the C tier. I have to say, I really whined about Dusclops a lot during this video because I don't really like how it plays, but after the final run, I do think that it was quite reliable. If I came back to do an Emerald run on stream and I only had like an hour and 40 minutes, I think Dusclops would be a fairly sure bet that I would get around the same time. So for consistency, it gets a check mark, but for early game fun, it gets a big sad face. Thanks so much if you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, it really does mean the world to me. Now, if you have made it this far, you are incredible. I'll see you in my next video.